socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. And in America, for example, the banks that got in trouble got bailed out by the government. That's socialism. And they, people are arguing against socialism in America, and yet it's probably the most socialist country in the world right now. Uh, we have a system which isn't even a proper capitalist system. Uh, rich people make mistakes that they don't get punished. Uh, poor people make mistakes that they get punished. Yeah? Or even worse, that they don't make any mistake and they are forced to yeah, that, uh, pay for the mistakes of the rich. When the taxpayer is footing the bill for the misplaced speculation of bankers, then suddenly, instead of the economy serving the human being, the human being is now in perpetual service to amoral financial organizations. It was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, who after 9-11 slashed interest rates to encourage lending. Bankers needed new participants to keep cash flowing into a system that had become a global pyramid scheme. All this newly created money entered the housing market and created unprecedented inflation. House prices rose and rose. New mothers were forced back into the workplace to service huge home loans, and the Anglo-American dream became all about land speculation. The housing market in the West isn't about ownership. The housing market in the West, because it's the only way ordinary people can get ahead, and ordinary people can't get ahead but by wages, what we've created is a mass bubble economics around housing. So that sucks in a huge amount of capital, takes capital for genuine innovations in the economy, and puts it into a speculative use that has no genuine productive outcome. It's interesting, if you talk to people in Germany, for example, they don't see a connection between owning a piece of property and, and being inclined to be, towards being democratic. There's lots of people who rent their housing there, and they're perfectly comfortable with that arrangement. But it is true that in somewhat different contexts, both Mr. Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher pushed for more people to own housing. And actually, this is part of the problem, because if you push people to buy housing before they're ready, and if, so if, you, if you push very dubious loans on them, and they don't understand what they get themselves into, you can have huge adverse repercussions, exactly what led to, in part, the subprime housing crisis in the United States. Uh, that's not anything to do with democracy, that's just a bad economic idea. The breakthrough that occurred around the year uh, 2000 in the United States was when bankers found out that the poor are honest. And uh, they realized that if you're poor, if you're not rich, uh, you have a different set of values. And you think that a debt is a debt, and it's something that has to be paid. And the people will try to pay the debts that they're stuck with, even if the debts are not valid, even if the debts uh, are much more than they expected, even if they really can't pay the debts. The lending and banking institutions, uh, when they drew up contracts with interest rates, with flexible interest rates, I think they knew in the beginning that these problems were going to come back later on where folks weren't going to be able to afford the mortgages as the interest rates increased. It put a lot of people in situations where they were taking food out of refrigerators, taking kids out of higher education. They're not able to afford college anymore. And it is making a really, really bad situation worse. The banks engaged in what was a criminal conspiracy to charge more to the blacks and Hispanics. The banks got together, backed the Bush administration to block the state prosecutions of uh, racial lending in order to exploit and charge more to the minorities. These are loans which were made by one of the major lenders in the city and in this country, Wells Fargo, in which Wells Fargo targeted minority communities in the city, uh, put borrowers into loans that they could not afford, put borrowers into loans um, that, that were of the subprime variety, therefore more expensive and less advantageous to the borrowers. Hiding predatory lending practices in the small print of complex financial products was only ever going to enrich one set of interests. Many of the communities in which African Americans live in the city were establishing momentum. There was development activity that was occurring. We were seeing signs of vitality in many of these communities and the results of the Wells Fargo foreclosures and the subprime lending practices of that lender and others um, has significantly impaired that progress and, and brought it to a halt. 
They not worrying about, they don't, they don't come in the heart of it. Like you in the heart of it, so you see, they don't really see the struggle if they don't come in the heart of it. They see the outside of it. That's like looking at the cover of a book and seeing the outside of the, seeing the outside of a book. But if you don't go inside the book, then you'll never know what the book about. So they're not worrying about nobody else but themselves. And I think it's wrong because if they come in the heart of it and they see it, they'll be willing to help. What happened in Baltimore is just one example of what is happening all around the world. One way to frame this injustice is by branding it a race issue. But when we look really closely, we can see that there is something at play here that transcends race, profit. Not an accident, for instance, that we had the deregulation in our financial industry that was such a disaster. Uh, the lobbyists of the finance industry amount to five per congressperson. In other words, they pay, pay five people for every congressman to explain to them, persuade them, that they should pass legislation that is favorable to the financial industry. The poor people who are devastated don't have the money. They couldn't hire five per congressman. So the way our, our democracy works, it's an unlevel playing field. The financial sector has acquired enormous power, partly through political contributions, so buying favors, but mostly through ideological control, convincing people that finance is good, more finance is better, and unregulated finance without limit is best. And, and that is really the, the cornerstone of this, what we call in the United States, the Wall Street Washington corridor. I mean, if people need any proof as to who's controlling Washington, when the bailout came after Lehman Brothers collapsed, 80% of the population was against the bailout. Notwithstanding that, the uh, Congress passed the bailout, just showing, in my view anyway, that it's really under the control of banking interests. It's not a reflection of good democracy when a company, a group of companies, an industry, says uh, our interests are more important than the national interest. How can that happen? Very easy. That's the role of campaign contributions, lobbying, and America's political structure. Uh, we have a flawed democracy. This is an advanced oligarchy in the sense that uh, its main mechanism of control, if you like, is through convincing people that you really need, for example, the six biggest banks in the United States in their particular, in the particular form they exist today with the very light level of regulation. And if you don't have them, if you try to change that, all kinds of awful things will happen. And this is not really blackmail. I mean, it sounds like blackmail, but they convince you it's not blackmail, it's just that's the way the world is. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh my goodness, you just have to cooperate with them. It's very clever. The Fed is essentially the lobbyist for the commercial banking system. When you say you want to turn regulation over to the Fed, you're saying the financial sector and Wall Street should be self-regulated. And uh, the Wall Street has veto power over whoever is going to be the head of the Federal Reserve. As long as you give veto power over the regulators to Wall Street, as long as you pick the bank regulators from the banking industry itself, uh, you can forget any thought of uh, calling it regulation. It's deregulation, and to call it regulation instead of deregulation is using Orwellian doublethink. Democracy is government by the people. Plutocracy is government by the rich. In a typical plutocratic state, economic inequality is high, social mobility low, and because of continuous exploitation of the masses, workers find it nearly impossible to climb out of poverty. The equal voting rights movement in the early 20th century abolished a system where rich people had more votes than poor people. But today, lobbying has put pay to that and reduced the American political system to a mere clearinghouse for the concerns of the rich. The Goldman Sachs machine is one of using profits to buy influence in Washington to change laws to make it easier to make money on Wall Street to be used to buy influence in Washington. So it's a self-reinforcing malfeasance machine that uh, is continuing to grow as a parasite in the economy and continuing to kill the host. 
Famous for claiming it did God's work, Goldman Sachs is one of the most influential investment banks in the world. Its alumni often occupy positions of great influence in governments and central banks. In September 2008, barely a month before the stock market crash, Goldman, supposedly a pillar of the free market, changed its banking status from investment to commercial. This meant it was now eligible for state protection. Socialism for the rich, right there. Goldman Sachs are extremely efficient at what they do. Their task is to make money. Uh, they make bank robbers like Willie Sutton look like modest amateurs. Uh, they're huge bank robbers, but it's legal. The system is set up so that they can do it. In the recent years, they've been selling securities put together from mortgages that they knew were worthless. Uh, so they're selling these things to unwitting consumers, making a ton of money on it. Meanwhile, they're betting that they're going to fail because they know that it, what they're peddling is rotten. So they placed bets with the credit default swaps and other things with a huge insurance company, AIG, and that was insuring Goldman Sachs against the failure of the stuff they're peddling. During America's subprime collapse, Goldman traders Michael Swenson and Josh Birnbaum made a $4 billion profit by short-selling junk mortgages. Backed by Dan Sparks, internally Goldman Sachs called their position the big short and bet against their own clients. Senator Carl Levin called Goldman Sachs chief executive Lloyd Blankfein to a Senate subcommittee to testify under oath. Much has been said about the supposedly massive short Goldman Sachs had on the U.S. housing market. The fact is, we were not consistently or significantly net short the market in residential mortgage-related products in 2007 and 2008. We didn't have a massive short against the housing market, and we certainly did not bet against our clients. Riding the big short in 2007 made billions of dollars for Goldman. And so far, they've got away scot-free with this massive heist. So they're now back bigger than before, richer than before. Uh, biggest profits they've had in history, you know, huge bonuses. They're doing great. Uh, a, lot of what they're, a lot of what they're doing has, in fact, probably uh, maybe all of it, has almost nothing to do with the benefit of the economy. Can there be any objection to genuinely talented people earning big money if they bring something new and tangible to the world? If they take great personal risks with their own money and actually bring greater prosperity for all? In a free market, if I have a brilliant idea that I can run an automobile on grass clippings, as an example, and I produce that car, my motivation might be to make money. But if the market says, my goodness, this is the greatest automobile ever invented by mankind, and I make a billion dollars, I've not only served myself, but I have served everyone else that needs transportation. And that is the brilliance of a free market, is that paradox that you can serve yourself and simultaneously serve others. And that's what it's all about. But how many of the general public have achieved greater prosperity through a banker's bonus? It was against the holy backdrop of St Paul's Cathedral in London that Goldman Sachs vice chairman and mouthpiece Lord Griffiths gave insight into how certain bankers really think. The devoted Christian defended extortionate bonuses. I'm not a person of despair, I'm a person of hope. And I think that we have to tolerate the inequality as a way to achieving greater prosperity and opportunity for all. The fundamental Christian view, and I would say of Islam as well, and certainly of Judaism, <clears throat> is that wealth is to be shared. Money has to be shared. You can't take it with you. And, and from that develops a whole lot of stuff about justice and the economy and so on. And we've lost that. And instead, we've got people accumulating more and more and I just think it's, I just think it's disgusting that people have lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they can't pay their mortgages from bankers who made a big mistake and then paid enormous bonuses. I'm sorry, that is simply wrong. And I can't understand 
why we are not more vociferous about that. Uh, when rich people tell you that they specifically have to be rich through these egregious rip-off mechanisms, uh, that's just self-serving propaganda and it should be disregarded. It is true that if you, when you organize human society, some people get ahead and some people struggle. That's a natural mechanism. Um, but saying, oh, we've got to have inequality, therefore Goldman Sachs must be organized along the following lines, that's a complete non sequitur. At what juncture, at what point does morality enter into economic, uh, the economic calculus? In a way, uh, many people think that Adam Smith gave us a free pass, uh, uh, a way not to think about morality. Because what Adam Smith said was that individuals in the pursuit of their self-interest are led as if by an invisible hand to the general well-being of society. Now let me make it clear, Adam Smith didn't really say that. <laughs> that is to say, Adam Smith was very much aware that businesses, when they got together, conspired against the public interest, raised prices. He was aware of monopoly. He was aware of the importance of education that the private sector couldn't provide. So he himself was aware of all the limitations, but his latter-day descendants have forgotten all those caveats. Adam Smith was the godfather of classical economics, but since its publication, his work has been used as a political football, financiers twisting his words to suit them. Lord Griffiths advocates ruthless individualism to push this idea that if bankers get rich, then we get rich too, through a process known as trickle-down economics, or horse and sparrow theory. If you feed the horse enough oats, some will pass through to the road for the sparrows. The idea is that extreme wealth concentrated on a small minority will eventually trickle down to everyone else. But it doesn't work. Because by the time the money reaches the people at the bottom of our money pyramid, it's lost its purchasing power. But the public are now confused as to why our political leaders have allowed this to happen, and quite naturally, now ask why. Because our political processes are badly flawed. They're badly flawed because of the dependence on lobbyists on campaign contributions. So that's why, you know, my view and a view I think of a, a lot of people is that we have to restructure our political processes to give more voice to the ordinary citizen and less voice to, to, the, to the interest group, to the moneyed groups, to, to those who, who, who have taken such a large role in, in shaping our tax code, our regulatory regulations, and so forth. I stood on the front step of Colin Powell's house. And I look at him and say, what, what, what next, boss? And he says, what do you mean? And I said, what next? Where are you going next? I'm going to write my book. I said, no, I know, I know you're going to write your book, but you're not going to do that for the rest of your life. Where are you going next? He said, maybe a cabinet position, but first, but first, money. I said, money? He said, yeah, millions. That's the only way you can be a cabinet officer in the American government. Oh, wow. The Democrats and the Republicans are beholden to corporate interests, and until they become unbeholden to those corporate interests, we will never have a well-governed republic. The inherent inequity in our system of money, banking and politics has not just had consequences domestically, but also on a massive scale globally. Oh, 
Western leaders have presented their military campaign in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan as a moral obligation. But are there other reasons for it? The first financial beneficiary of America's foreign policy is the military. In particular, those who supply it with arms and equipment. The military has won wars, but how successful has it been in its bigger aim to eradicate terrorism? The drone attacks not only failed, but they've created extra extremism. They've helped in radicalization of youth in the Northwest frontier and also in certain parts of Punjab and Pakistan. And because time after time, and sometimes, you know, there's a feeling that America does this deliberately to destabilize Pakistan. I'm not so sure about that, but I certainly think those people who actually support this policy Every time you kill 10, the so-called terrorists, you create 500 more because they see the drone attacks as a, an attack on a sovereign state of Pakistan. If they really wanted to flush them out, there was no need for a huge military operation in Swat, causing the entire district to become internally dis displaced persons. The population of Swat is 1.8 million. There are 2.3 million refugees in the country. The whole district has been emptied. This wouldn't have been necessary if they had carried out a surgical commando operation to get the militant leaders. But they allowed them to escape, all of them. After the military, the next financial beneficiary are those who win the contracts to conduct the rebuilding process. In the West, people might even feel optimistic when they hear that the US is pumping tens of billions of newly created dollars into developing nations to build infrastructure. But often this too doesn't seem to achieve the publicized goals. Is there another reason we give these countries aid? We economic hitmen have created the world's first truly global empire and we've done it primarily without the military. We work many different ways but perhaps the most common is that we'll take a third world country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. However, the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, highways, industrial parks, things that benefit a few wealthy families in that country as well as our corporations, but don't help the majority of the people at all. They're too poor to buy electricity or drive cars on the highways. They don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. But they're left holding a huge debt. Infrastructure, which has used heavy loans from the World Bank and IMF and made from grants from uh, Western countries, they've all gone into benefiting the elite and the feudal classes. Uh, they have not benefited the people. A lot of money goes to these consultants and companies from the West who charge huge amounts of money and actually the real money on projects and on ordinary people is very limited. The masses have very little already. So those landlords who have the infrastructure and who are going to make money because of the infrastructure that is built through their roads, they will prosper. But the ones who don't have any resources, they've not had jobs, there isn't an economic activity for them in terms of manufacturing goods so they can sell and they can also prosper. When you don't have that, what do they do? They resort to joining the Taliban because they see the enemy coming in and taking away what little bit they have. President Obama, I understand, wants to invest seven and a half billion dollars in Pakistan's infrastructure to alleviate poverty and, you know, take away all the divisions and all the anti-American sentiment over here. Whatever his reasons are, we can do without it. 
In fact, it's the worst possible thing he can do. This kind of help is actually going to be a hindrance. It's just going to make matters worse. It will bring this contrived war and terror into our rural areas. How much of US foreign policy is genuinely altruistic? And how much is it influenced by the banks and corporations that profit so tremendously from it? America's evangelism of democracy is riddled with contradictions, not least of which this idea of promoting democracy at the point of a gun or opposing regimes which are democratic but not in the way that America wants. So too, this idea that America has been promoting free market capitalism has also been riddled with contradictions because the reality is that American firms tend to make most money when countries are at the cusp of change, certainly American financial firms, and in a sense they want markets that are changing structurally but not too free and too um, transparent because they make money when markets are a bit opaque. Is it any wonder developed nations are fighting in underdeveloped countries when so many are making so much money out of it without ever really having to face up to or even witness the consequences of their actions? So what if five million kids died in Africa because of debt last year? Uh, you know, I got a bonus of a million pounds and if I have that conversation, I've had it with some uh, uh, bankers who've you know, been in the business a long time and um, they listen politely, they're very polite, very charming and at the end they say, well, Tariq, it's lovely meeting you again and they go back to the office and do another loan deal for Tanzania or something. I've known a lot of terrorists, quote unquote. I've met them, I've interviewed them for books, I've known them since I was an economic hip, and I've never met one who wanted to be a terrorist. They all want to be with their families back on the farm. They're driven to terrorism because they've lost the farm. It's been inundated with water from a hydroelectric project or with oil from oil derricks. Their farm's been destroyed. They can't make a living for their kids. Or in the case of the Somali pirates, uh, their fishing waters have been destroyed. And that's why they've turned to this. It isn't because they want to be, be pirates or, or, or terrorists. Now, there may be a few crazy people. There are a few crazy people. People with nut, their nuts loose. There'll always be serial killers. There'll always be crazy people. Maybe Osama bin Laden is one of them. But they do not get a following unless there's a terrible injustice going on. And people are starving and they're deprived. And then they will follow these crazy people because they seem to offer an alternative if we want to do away with terrorism, if we want to have what we in the United States call homeland security, we've got to recognize that the whole planet is our homeland. What does the word terrorist actually mean? Many terrorists would sooner describe themselves as freedom fighters. Could it be that the charge of terrorism could just as easily be made against Western corporations, speculators and policy makers? Uh, well, when we talk about terrorism, it means what they do to us, not what we do to them. And what they do to us can be pretty ugly, although it's, it's not even a fraction of what we do to them. I mean, take, say, 9-11. That was a pretty serious act of terrorism, maybe the worst single act of terrorism in history. But it could have been worse. I mean, suppose, for example, that Al-Qaeda had uh, bombed Washington, uh, bombed the White House. It killed the president, installed a harsh military dictatorship, uh, brought in a bunch of economists who uh, drove the economy into its worst disaster in history. Well, that would have been worse than 9-11. And I'm not making it up. It happened. What's called the first 9-11 in South America, namely in Chile. On the 11th of September 1973, the democratically elected Chilean president Salvador Allende was overthrown in a coup. A dictatorship under Augusto Pinochet was established that ruled Chile until 1990. There was the systematic suppression of all political dissidents. Thousands were imprisoned and murdered. Who was involved in that first 9-11? Uh, it's not hard to find them. Uh, right in uh, Washington and London and so on. But that's off the agenda. It doesn't count. There's a principle of ideology that we must never look at our own crimes. We should, on the other hand, uh, exult in the crimes of others and in our own nobility in opposing them. 
the root causes of so-called terrorism will not be solved by increasing economic inequality. If governments really are serious about combating terrorism, then they must start with real structural reform back home. As long as banking empires chase infrastructure and debt deals in pursuit of profit, the West will continue to export injustice through finance. Millions more will be displaced, terrorism will thrive, and neo-colonialism will continue to end more and more lives around the world. What's happened is that we have moved from a relatively empty world to a relatively full world. That is empty of us and all of our stuff to now full of us and all of our stuff. In my lifetime, uh, the world population has tripled. And the populations of other things, of cars, houses, boats, uh, all these other things that put a load on the environment too, just like human bodies, uh, those are vastly more than triple. So the world is very, very full of what we might call uh, man-made capital. Uh, and it's becoming more and more empty of what used to be there, what we might call natural capital. We are the first generation, we in the rich developed world, are the first generation to have got to the end of the real benefits of economic growth. For uh, hundreds of years, the best way of uh, raising the real quality of human life has been to raise material living standards. And that's what's driven the huge rises in life expectancy and increases in happiness and other measures of well-being. But all those have now come detached from economic growth. And although life expectancy continues to rise in the rich world, uh, it's no longer related to the amount of economic growth the country has at all. And the same is true of measures of happiness and measures of well-being. The paradox is the more we grow, the more poverty we create. Our self-interested economic system seems to be continually missing a trick. So as we keep plundering the Earth's natural capital, is it time to rethink our Western definition of progress? When I look at the world, I look at it much the way Royal Dutch Shell looks at it. They have one of the best strategic entities in the world, private or public. And Royal Dutch Shell has posited two scenarios. One is called Blueprint and is obviously uh, a planned corporate uh, structure where world leaders get together and they think about things like energy transformation, planetary warming, and dwindling fossil fuels and so forth. Um, the other is called Scramble. And Scramble is uh, pretty much what it sounds like too. It's a mess. Uh, interestingly enough, in 2075, the ending year for these scenarios, as I recall, we get to about the same place. It's just that Blueprint leaves a lot less blood on the floor. Um, Scramble leaves a lot of blood on the floor as people fight for these resources and so forth. The reason oil companies are drilling miles under the sea is that the world's easily accessible oil has already been found and largely consumed. Not only are oil supplies dwindling, major new metals discoveries are becoming increasingly rare. 40% of the world's agricultural land is seriously degraded, and ever more volatile yields continue to be unevenly distributed. It may be that the looming environmental threat is not global warming, but the exhaustion of the world's resources. We're going to have uh, struggles for finding land sufficient to grow the agricultural products for a what the United Nations says is going to be a 9 billion Earth population. We're going to struggle over non-renewable fossil fuels as they run out. I think Shell posits about 2075, they'll be gone. 
Um, and we're going to struggle over uh, things like water and other precious resources that are necessary to our life and to our economy. And this could be, as Shell says, a blueprint affair with world leaders working together to share and share uh, alike. Or it could be a real mess, and Shell incidentally bets on the mess. Just like the baby boomers' failure to look to the next generation, our outdated competitive mentality for a world of depleted resources could have devastating consequences. Our economic setup encourages one-upmanship, competition and comparison, whereas the progress humans have made over millennia has been largely based on cooperation. In any species, in almost any animal, there is uh, always the potential for huge uh, conflict because with any, any species, uh, all members of that species have the same needs. So they might fight each other for food and shelter and nest sites and territory and uh, sexual partners, all that kind of thing. But human beings have always had the other possibility. Uh, we have the possibility to be the best source of, of support and love and assistance and cooperation, much more so than any other animal. And so other people can be the best or the worst. You can be my worst rival or my best source of support. In a progressive society, to meet our common economic, social and cultural needs, we must move from globalization to localization. The benefits of a communal sense of fellowship, responsibility and purpose in a life driven by production, not consumption, would lead to happiness and satisfaction. Indeed, we must ask, have our modern consumerist lifestyles made us happy? I think if one had been living in the 19th century and somebody had told you that a hundred years later people were going to be living in this extraordinary wealth and comfort, you know, with central heating and being able to throw away such a high proportion of our food as we do, we'd imagine that we'd be living in a state of extraordinary social harmony and uh, everything would be rosy. And it's really quite remarkable, the contrast between if you like, the material success of our societies and, and the social failure. The growth economy demands that we make consumption a way of life. He who dies with the most toys became the ambition, and retail replaced spiritual satisfaction. Unsurprisingly, sales of antidepressants skyrocketed. The fact is that the world economy over the last few years, a good share of my lifetime has been built either on the military or on producing items that most people don't need and really don't even want when you come right down to it, but we all gotta have them. Consumerism is driven by our extraordinarily social nature, uh, that we want to have the stuff so we look good in other people's eyes. It's because I experience myself through other people's eyes, the feelings of shame and embarrassment or pride and um, maybe feeling envied, uh, all those things. So, you know, it, it, the goods are just a way of, if you like, mediating the relationship between yourself and others in this extraordinarily alienated hierarchy. What's really suffered is human relationships, family life, the things that really matter to us. And in the end, the only thing that makes human beings happy isn't money. It's very clear that past a certain level, you only get marginal gains from wealth. What really makes us happy is other people. It's our relationship with other people that's really been damaged by the last 30 years. We trust them less, we have less interaction with them, we bond less than ever before, we marry less and marriage is under more threat than ever before. And all the associations that represent sort of permanent, unconditioned human affection are being eroded or damaged. And that's the real legacy of the last 30 years. And in some sense, we've got to recover and rehumanize our lives. Otherwise, not only will they be nasty, brutish and short, but they'll be lonely. The West is coming to the realization that its human project is failing. The West was so convinced that if you push people to achieve as individuals, the accumulated achievement of individuals would make for a successful society. And what the West is now beginning to realize is that the individual achievement uh, without incorporating the vulnerable community is a myth.
The idea was make your own life, be individually aspiring, and then you'll be individually achieving, and then you'll be individually prosperous, and then you'll be individually happy. Uh, you end up doing that in a glass jar. And the glass jar has a limited height, and it's encapsulating, and in the end, you die of lack of oxygen. Human beings are alive because they seek attachment and because they're propelled by affection. So the isolated achieving individual in the end implodes. In order to find